So in Washington, D.C., right, so I'm living between D.C., New York, and here, whenever I'm in D.C. or in New York, anywhere in the States, and I'm in an Uber, hmm. and I'm talking to the Uber driver, the Uber driver will, you know, will tell me, he or she will tell me about all the things that they do, and I'll say, wow, you know, you're, you're an incredible entrepreneur, right, because they're telling me about all the different jobs they have, and they're, they're very proud, and they're very bold, and they state that they're an entrepreneur. This happens in D.C., happens in New York. So the other night, my wife and I are going with the boys. We're going to Deshoom. Yep. Can I say shout out to Deshoom? <laughs> <laughs> Send over some free. Actually, I just want to be able to get in line. Yeah. yeah. Skip the line, should I yeah. say? For yeah. So we're on our way to Deshoom, and in the car with this young man. He's probably 25, 26 years old, and he runs. He has three essentially things that he does you know, three products slash services that he sells. And on top of it, he's an Uber driver. And I was telling him about an entrepreneur's conference that I wanted to create. And I asked him, you know, would you be interested in going to something like this? And he said, well, you know, I don't feel, like, he said, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur, right? He, he didn't even associate himself with being an entrepreneur. And I thought it was, it was powerful because that's the theme that I feel here yeah. in the UK is that there are many people who are actually already running businesses yeah. themselves, but they don't see themselves as an entrepreneur. Are you seeing any of this? And if so, why? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really good question. And, um, you know, the way I would think about it is that, you know, when we encounter entrepreneurs, um, you know, as, as uh, founders of Cornerstone, often when they when they talk about the businesses, they talk they talk about their baby, they talk about their side hustle, they talk about their their form of expression, as opposed to actually this is my primary vocation. It's something that just that almost was created organically over a period of time, and so I think that's that's what happens that that people almost fall into entrepreneurship, and that's why they struggle to identify with that word. It, so it was never that their original intent. Their original intent was just to pay the bills. Right. Their original right. intent was to just, you know, express their their form of talent, whether it's through creativity, whether it's through um, clothing, whether it's through finding a small opportunity here and sort of sort of taking advantage of that. That that's what I think happens in the UK, um, and and it's great because there's this environment where where people really embrace that. Um, this idea of kind of being fluid and being able to work across lots of different sectors, being generalists, you know, not not being pinned or tied to just one to one thing. Mm. Right. And I think and I think what you're touching on, Rodney, is almost the root cause, because if you'd ask, you know, the individuals that you just spoke about, you know, how come they don't see themselves as entrepreneurs? It's because they're trying to survive. You know, that that's how they came to start running their business in the first place. Perhaps they work, were working in an environment where they weren't able to get promoted or reach certain goals and haven't been able to, I guess, you know, get as far as they've liked or pay bills. So they've said, right, you know, in order for me to progress, you know, get further up this, I guess, value chain, this food chain, I'm going to start a business and survive and get by. So they've been busy trying to create their business and move forward. They haven't even sat to think about, Oh, actually, I'm running a business here. Right. I'm an entrepreneur. And, and I'm trying to win. Yeah. yeah. But now, is is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because let's liken this to, and I don't want to label all Americans the same way, but I'm going to tell you what, especially in the dating space where mm. I was for 10 years, right, mm. as a matchmaker, is that you're flipping through the Tinder or whatever it may mm. be, and you know what every dude is? He's a CEO. Mm. Yeah. Every guy on a dating <laughs> app <laughs> is the CEO. Even if he's a CEO he's of nothing. He yeah. claims that title. Yeah. He yeah. claims it. Oh, he's yeah. a CEO. He's living with his mama in his mom's <laughs> basement. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But he's still a CEO. Yeah. But I've noticed this about so many Americans is that they'll present, yeah. I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm running this business. Meanwhile, you know, you have no sales. Yeah. yeah. But But I wonder though, is that actually helpful for them? The fact that they've already branded themselves as this something that's, you know, that's significant versus a lot of the mindset here, and maybe I'm wrong on this, mm. which is, you know what, I'm not even an entrepreneur yet. Mm, yeah. I'm just out here trying to survive, mm. right? Do you, know what, do you know what I think it is, Paul? I think it's, 
And it's something that I really admire about Americans. It's the sense of vision. You know, before you've even got it, you can see it. You know, you can see it, you can live it. You might even be using the credit card to pay for it, right? But right. It's, it's there, it's right there in front of you. And it's, and it's sometimes, you know, as, as Europeans, as, as British people, you know, we, we come at it with a slightly different lens, which is the market's tough, it's competitive, it's hard. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about anything until I've actually got something of substance that I can. I can point to. Yes, and I think we can learn from each other. You know, I think. I think Americans this, this idea that actually you've got to. You've got to visualize it first, and then worry about growing into it later. That's that's something that I think we we try to embrace at Cornerstone as well. You know, we've got massive, huge ambitions, but we're not there yet. Do you, right. do you, think, do you think that's a cultural thing? Yeah, I think. I think it is a cultural yeah. thing. I think it's. I think it's how we're brought up. You know, one, one thing that I, I really admire about um, the US is, you know, sales is seen as a profession. Yeah. <laughs> as a vocation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not here. No. Really? No. There's no salesmen and women. Well, they're, 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 they're sales people, but they're not viewed, you know, in, in a high regard. They're not, they're not viewed as, you know, in the same vein as a, a CTO or a CEO. They don't see, they don't see that function in the same way. Ah, it's, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Whereas over there, it's a lot more prominent and it's a lot more of a focus, right? Yeah. And, and not only that, I would say that even as a skill, you know, uh, one of the most impactful interviews I've ever done was with Byron Allen. Mm. Byron Allen runs a multi-billion dollar entertainment company. He's a black man, runs a multi-billion yeah. dollar entertainment company. Never raised any money, by the way. Wow. No, none. And what he often talked about in that interview is that the most important skill set as a CEO is your salesmanship, your ability to sell. The same thing I interviewed Ted Leonsis, another billionaire. He talked about the importance of salesmanship, the ability to sell. So to hear you all say that that's not given va of high value here is, is mind-blowing. Yeah, I think, I, I think in the UK, at least in my experience, um, you know, what's valued is strong leadership. What's valued is, is having a strategic plan, having a sense of where you're going. Um, and then on the, on the other side, it, there's, a, there's a real value around you know, financial discipline, around being prudent, around making sure that you're, you're still in the game, that you survive. Because you know, one of the biggest challenges in the UK is you know, when, you, when you launch a startup business, you know, 90, I think 90% of the businesses fell within the first 18 months. Oh, that's a high rate. Yeah. It's a very high rate, yeah. So actually part of the challenge of just, you know, being part of the conversation and being an entrepreneur is just surviving. Right. Surviving for those first couple of years. Right. Um, because because of the, the, the way in which the, the market is set up over here, it's just so competitive, it's so crowded, there's so many different people trying to do lots of different things, there's lots of innovation coming on. Yes, yes. And so that's that's kind of what people focus on. And then, and then on top of all of that, which makes it extraordinarily challenging, right, for an entrepreneur, is I also feel like there's less support in the ecosystem here versus in the U.S. So, and, and this is where I could be wrong too, so come across and slap me if I'm wrong <laughs> on this one, is I, in, in the U.S., I feel like as an entrepreneur, there's a litany of organizations that you could join to support what you're doing. There are, uh, you know, an endless number of other entrepreneurs who are doing what you're doing, and they don't mind telling you, hey, here's exactly what I did. Let me break it down for you, right? There's a lot of support in the ecosystem. Here, the number one thing that I hear from entrepreneurs is, you know what, we don't support each other like we should here. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think um, we're, the size matters as well. Um, we're, we're a lot smaller um, population-wise, um, you know, as a shared number. So, off the back of that, you're going to have less, um, less of an ecosystem, less organisations, less businesses, and, and and from that regard. So, I think that's one of the challenges. And also, I think historically, um, especially in our demographic, we've been more focused on people. We've been more focused on getting a career, um, mm. getting a job, yes. and and trying to progress in that way, as opposed to you know, starting a business and um, and trying to progress in that way, like like you alluded to earlier. You know, in the U.S., from from our understanding, it's very much you know the American dream. You know, you can create these businesses, so so it's very much in your DNA in regards to creating um, entrepreneurs and, and businesses. Whereas here, I guess it's more of a more recent relative to to, to you guys 
in regards to that business. And that's why I think ultimately the the ecosystem is is, is a bit smaller. But I think it's changing. It's changing because it is, now yeah. there's a lot of organizations, you know, like ourselves, um, uh, Impact X, um, you know, Backstage and, and, and a lot of all those organizations who, and we all work together and we all, we're all speaking. So hopefully that you should see that come through and change over the next few few years. What, why is it, you just said something that, that's, that's really fascinating to me and that is that, that um, the DNA, well, you know, obviously the DNA of the United States is, hey, big, we're big dreamers, yeah. right? Um, but it's beginning to actually happen here yeah. where there are a lot of people who are now looking at entrepreneurship as an avenue. Yeah. What what's created that change in the marketplace here? It could be the fact that our, our generation, so we're, we're all, a lot of us are second generation uh, minorities who, who would have come from um, the Caribbean, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, I guess those are the, sort of the largest um, nations. And when our parents sort of came over in the 70s, 80s, their first thing was to get jobs and, and often it was uh, labor type positions uh, cleaning jobs or, or cab drivers bus drivers and that sort of thing so then naturally the ones that came after would would look at jobs as, as a way to move forward so you would you know be, try and become a, an accountant or a lawyer or, or that's your first look but as we progressed and we've had more disposable income and we've seen what's done on the other side and, and the bridges become a lot shorter we felt okay right well actually well we can maybe a job isn't the only thing we could do to move forward. You could, we could actually create businesses, and we could, we could progress in, in that light. And I think the second generation um, millennials and um, Generation X, who's coming after us, there's, there's, you know, they've realised that this is the way forward, and, and they can actually create businesses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the other key thing is that you've got, we've got success stories. You know, if you look at the US, the US have got so many. You know, you can't even count them on one hand now. You know, Google, Facebook, Apple. You know, you've got entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley that you can kind of walk, walk to, walk, walk over to, and speak to, and have a chat with them. And you know, they're just like you. They went to college, they went to school, they dropped out, they created a business, they've made it into a massive multi-billion-pound um, operation. Um, you know, in the UK and in Europe, that hasn't really been there. Although that's now starting to change, we can now start to point to winners like Blah Blah Car and Spotify and Farfetch, and and I think as those reference points continue to build over time, it, it creates that sense of confidence that says, yeah, of course, we can do it too. Right. You know, Europe as right. a market is very, very different because you've got different languages, it's slightly more fragmented than versus the US, but but there's huge opportunity, there's huge talent. Right. And um, it's about pointing to those reference points. Um, and I think the more that you, you see of those, the more you, it gives you confidence that you can you can do the same. Right. And also, too, you know, Rodney, you're talking about like the, the fragmentation of the market, right, especially throughout all of Europe. Yeah. I find that that could actually be to the advantage of the entrepreneur. You know, the fact that there's so much competition, you know, the fact that there is so much difference of culture or language, et cetera. It, it almost, to me, it almost... It, it, it's almost like it's the gift that comes with the curse, and the yeah. gift is, is that you actually have to be better, right? I mean, is 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 that the case? Because I, I've you know from some of the data I've seen is that so the UK in terms of entrepreneurship kind of outperforms the rest of Europe. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think I was looking at some stats on this the other day. So, in terms of startups created across Europe. So like forty percent of them start in London. Yes. Start in the UK. Okay. So why is that? So there's lots of different ingre ingredients. I think the first thing is that the in terms of regulation, the UK and London in particular has one of the most um, business friendly regulatory environments that you can find. Okay. So to give you a very very simple example, we have something called EIS and VCT, which effectively is a tax efficient product that encourages a high net worth someone with a hundred thousand pounds of disposable income to invest directly into a business. Ah, uh, okay. Now, if you do that under this scheme, you get a tax you get tax relief of between thirty and fifty percent. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's one okay. of the most it's one of the most generous programs. Yeah, that's incredible. In terms of relief that you can find not not only in Europe but in the world. And so that creates this condition for businesses to say, you know what, I can raise my first half a million, my first million pounds in the UK because there are incentives from the high net worth community to invest directly, directly. into UK SMEs. So d if, I, if I'm a US business, can I take advantage of that scheme? You can, you would need to establish a, a UK presence. Okay. So you'd need to have a, a UK branch or be incorporated in the UK. 
Um, but you can absolutely take advantage of that scheme. Ah, uh, take note, all of my <laughs> <Yeah>. US friends. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to send a boat over for yeah. all the entrepreneurs. All right, so so the environment, so the regulatory environment, right? That's good. What you just are there other reasons why this environment is is right for entrepreneurs? Yeah, so I think you know access to talent. You know, we've got world class universities. You know, it's one of our biggest exports. Oxford, Cambridgeshire, uh, Cambridge being being two great examples. You know, you've got access to to great minds um, in terms of the availability of you know cutting edge IP. Um, we've got a fantastic um, liquid um, IPO market represented by the London Stock Exchange, which hosts not only some of our best and brightest UK companies, but also some of the best and brightest European and some US businesses as well, because it's viewed as a as a gateway to the global market. Yes, and yes. I think that that's always been London's strength. You know, being that kind of that kind of that position within Europe and more broadly, where you can kind of have an established presence in Europe and use that as kind of a, a jump off to then go into France or into Germany or into Spain or into Italy. Right. Or even take it to West Africa if you want Correct. to, exactly. Caribbean yeah. if you want yeah. to. Yeah. I find that to be beautiful about about I mean, London truly is the world's capital, without yeah. with, without question. You know, are there particular sectors that are maybe taking off faster than others because I um I don't know if it's just because of my work here but I feel like creatives that whole creative space media in particular is f phenomenal here yeah. you know to yeah. the, to the point where maybe some of the best in the world are, are you noticing sectors that are better than others here or or should I say growing faster than others or create creating bigger opportunities than others yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think definitely online content and the, the chase to create content it has been a big feature here. Um, you know, you, you see lots of companies who are trying, I guess, you know, emulate the Netflixes and, and, and the Amazon Primes and, 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 and individuals who are becoming um, successes on YouTube. So, it's, so I think it's only natural that, you know, that is one of the key um, successes and sectors which which people are trying to flock to okay. and where we see a lot of the capital uh, moving towards so sort of the media online content creating space okay is that so that's top that you see a lot of capital going towards online content creation yeah and and, wow. and it feeds off the sort of tech um um popularity as well right i mean uh, i brought them in from from sort of the days what, what, what would you say would you echo that yeah yeah absolutely i think you know that's that's been driven by the the penetration of the internet, but but more importantly, I think it's because there's there's more roots to that that consumer. Okay. You know, we're not focusing on linear programming anymore. We're not sitting in front of, you know, with our family at six o'clock <laughs> to watch, you know, you know, Family <laughs> Fortune or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah that's you funny. Know, I was going to say Family something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Family something. <laughs> Unless you're watching, um, you know, Steve Harvey doing something. But you know, you don't you don't just sit down and you just watch programming anymore. What you're doing is you're consuming the content that you want to consume on the platform or the device that you want to consume it yes. at the time you want to do it. So yes. that's creating a platform for really creative people to engage with particular audiences, whether it's you know females, black people, ethnic minorities, um, whether it's a certain age group or a certain interest group. So actually what's happening is you're seeing the, the audience fragment, yes, but the engagement, the content's going through the roof. Yes, that's yeah. what's happening. And there's and there's less barriers to entry, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, all you need is a good idea, a good vision, something creative, effectively a camera, um, you know, you're a team, and and you can start to produce. So you can get a lot further in your journey before capital arrives. Right, right, and and almost have the business case quite early for you to then take it to the next stage and, and scale your business. So I think that's why. It's it's been quite uh, popular. Okay. Any other sectors outside of that online content creation that that you feel are hot? Yeah. So we're we're seeing a lot. So so I'm so my day job is is working in VC, and, and one of the one of the key areas that we're really excited by is is data. Okay. And so the use of data, and obviously you know think about things like um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal with with Facebook, where people are becoming far more conscious of the value of their data yes. and how it's being leveraged by these large social media platforms. And so privacy is coming right to the top of the surface. But there's still a huge amount of insight in that data that lots of different businesses are trying to engage with, um, whether it's to drive conversion rates online, whether it's to be more targeted in terms of the types of ads that they serve to you, whether it's ensuring that you're more likely to engage with a particular type of content or a particular type of product or service. 
And so for us in particular, you know, businesses that can leverage your content and your data yes. in a way that makes you feel comfortable but allows for those insights to be drawn out, that, that's a really that, exciting That's space. a win. Okay. All right. I like it. I like it. So <laughs> yeah. I like it. We got online kind of. We have, we, have, <laughs> we, have, we have data. Hit me with a third. There must be a third hot London slash UK leading I mean, I'll, sector. I'll, for a third, I'll definitely add hair and beauty. Um, as as well, hair and beauty. That's for UK. There we go. Yeah. We got nods over here. Hair and beauty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, again, you know, in our in our demographic and a lot of the black businesses that we've seen have been um, sort of um, um, in the hair and beauty space or, or or cosmetics off the back of that. And and it's and I guess it's natural because you know if you look at the areas that where we're evident in, so let's say you know your Brixton or your, your Harlesden or, or Croydon or, or Lewisham, which is um, some of the largest populations of black people in those individuals, you know, you, you, you would see a string of shops, um, you know, women s selling hair or, or, or both genders actually, you know, with those businesses. So it's only natural that when it comes to um, a sector where there's opportunity to scale, you know, it's going to be that business who has, okay, they have two stores or, or, or three and, and, and they're trying to move towards having a chain of 10 and, and trying to get a bit more market share in, in that space. So I'll, I'll definitely add um, hair and beauty to hair that. And, and what, what's interesting about hair and beauty is that, you know, in the past within our community, the obsession was, you know, where can I get my next weave? Where can I, um, you know, focus on, um, you know, straightening my hair? Yeah, get this How jerry you, curl. Exactly. Where can I get? Where can <laughs> I get my? Your hair jerry curl. Get, did you? No, no, I think that no, was no, you I guys. Didn't, I didn't. <laughs> no, no, come on, you know you had a jerry curl. I had a jerry curl. But uh, that was the obsession. But now, what you're seeing is an explosion of natural hair. Yes. Yeah. And the products and the and the expertise and the insight yeah. and the focus on, you know, actually, I want to wear my afro out but yes. I want it to look good, I want it to grow, and I want it to be healthy, I want it to reflect my personality. But yes. I need some advice. Yes, and can I say this too on a personal note? Yeah. When my wife went from uh, texturized hair yeah. to natural, yeah. in my mind I thought, we're gonna save a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong. Yeah. She's spending more money more right. with her the natural quality. hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then they were, I was like, <laughs> get a perm or something. Yeah. Um, but wow, that's a, that's a, okay, I love it. I love it. So now, explain this to me, all right? Let's say that you are a UK-based business, yeah. and you're maybe in one of those three sectors or another sector, and you would like to partner with a business outside of the UK, all right? And let's say in the same conversation that you're maybe a US business, Canadian business, Jamaican business, mm. and you're looking at opportunities here in the UK. How do those two connect? And 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 I maybe I should start with should those two even be connecting? I mean, should you be right now on the ground level of your business thinking about partnering with companies abroad or or, or is that a good thing? You know, and and I bring that up because when I got here roughly 2 years ago to London, I thought to myself, wow, there's incredible opportunities here, yeah. incredible opportunities. And I was even thinking of how I could match make businesses yeah. back and forth. But is that smart, right, for the UK-based entrepreneur? And then if so, how do they go about doing it? And if you're in the US or abroad, how do you then partner with the business here? I think timing plays a big part in that journey as well. Because um, a lot of these businesses that we're seeing, or, or some of, are in their infant stages, so they're still trying to, I guess, create a presence in the UK first of all, um, and, and make sure that their business model works, and f trying to find, expand it from, let's say, a business is service in London primarily to expand into Manchester, to um, Birmingham, to um, Edinburgh, which is which is up north, and 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 then look at partnerships but in essence of course you know you want to you want to try and make your business as global as possible so we we should definitely be trying to encourage those conversations and um building it, the ecosystem such that you know you could have an offering in the uk and then look to partner with somebody um, in long island you know in new york or what have you and, and expand your presence and especially with um on you know online um 
aspects which which makes that quite easy to, to do right so but um, I think yep yeah, it's definitely timing um, you know individuals are trying to or businesses are trying to focus on what they can um, progress in, in their location where they are in, in the UK and then look at trying to expand those partnerships as they progress okay all right fair but but how like how does it get done though you know I, because l let's assume that you've already made the decision that it's a good idea, right? Actually, l let's let's use a real example. There's a woman I know. She's actually in the online content business. Mm. Uh, she's in w out of, outside of the Washington D.C. area, yeah. and she said, "You know what, Paul? She said I, I really want to come to London to mm. see what I can do. To I want to explore what opportunities exist here. How does she do that?" You know, how, like how, how does she mm. do that? And and I and I th I think this is this is so important because mm. I think this is part of that ecosystem. Yeah, it's having. The, uh, you know, uh, ecosystems are richer the more diverse they are. You know, and the more talent that's that's in it. In it. So if you have, let's say, that particular person, her name is Julian. Shout out Julian K. By the way, Sorry. I see you. Um, <laughs> uh, when she comes across here to the UK, yeah. she, what should she be doing specifically? Yeah, no, it's a good question. So there are lots of different ways um, that I, th I think, you know, various organizations are trying to encourage collaboration between the UK and the US. So to take a really simple example, you know, in the case of Julian, what I would encourage her to do is to connect with um, the ecosystem, the entrepreneurship ecosystem. So. You know, she's focusing on journalism and online content. You know, there are lots of events that are being held in London on a regular basis where, you know, they, they get journalists together, they get content providers together to talk about different stories, different um, topics that they want to discuss. Um, you know, I'd encourage her to do something like that. Um, in a kind of more formal way, you know, we have things like entrepreneurship visas where somebody who's international um, but has skills that they can bring to bear in the UK can apply for a visa to come and actually spend some time, um, usually with a with an expectation that that individual would would create jobs, maybe establish a presence permanently in the region. Okay, you know, maybe launch a, launch an office to kind of test the market. So that's something that she could also think about doing. Okay, um, but but you know the the opportunity for for work the collaboration between the UK and the US is is massive. Clearly, in a in a post Brexit. <laughs> Post Brexit, <laughs> right? Post we're going to be the best, <coughs> best we're buddies. Be best of buddies. Yeah. We're going to be best of buddies. <laughs> so, it. you know, and um, what, what's great about the UK and the US is that you know, yes, there are language differences, but we we in a sense speak the same language. Um, you know, the, the opportunity um, to engage in certain sectors and um, you know, in certain areas is is very very close. You, you know, Rodney, can, can you can you peel that back a little bit because sure. I, I think that uh, not a lot of us. Uh, understand how the climate is going to change in the UK post Brexit. I guess maybe no one knows <laughs> how the yeah. climate's gonna change post Brexit. <laughs> right. Do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then but but how does that impact entrepreneurs? Yeah. Especially because of the camaraderie that's going to happen between the US and the UK. Yeah. I mean in theory, a post Brexit UK has to be more outward looking. So that's that's the kind of the contradiction. You know, most people that voted for Brexit, or w one would argue from sort of opinion columns, is that they wanted the UK to be insular and to kind of prevent immigration and and to focus on almost being a protectionist country, focusing on on ourselves. But actually, I think the opposite is true. You know, what what the UK is saying is, yes, we want to leave the EU, but we still want to be friends with you. Right. And the reason why we want to leave the EU is because we want to launch trade deals with the rest of the world. So actually what we want to do is we want to strengthen our ties with the rest of the world and we want to be a truly global trading country that's engaging just as much with Asia and the US as we are with France and Italy. Yes. So what does that mean for an entrepreneur? What that means for an entrepreneur, it's not going to be plain sailing. No one's got a crystal ball. It's going to be difficult. But I think once we get out the other side, what we're going to find is an entrepreneur should hopefully have more freedom to engage not only with Europe, which is obviously one of our largest um, sort of markets in terms of a single block, but also with 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 countries and continents around the world. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So so a, a post Brexit UK is one where entrepreneurs will actually have more global opportunity. That's yeah. that's the that's theory. The idea, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and even, I mean, currently, even now, US and UK, it's 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 a big relationship. You know, they've got one of the largest bilateral um, relationship between the two of them. So, so there is a lot of trade happening, and I guess post Brexit, this would only move forward and, and increase in regards to the, the, the number of transactions that happen across um, the pond and over here. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, so there's one one other category that I wanted to get into, and then I want to jump into Cornerstone in particular. You know, so I went to uh, the Tate Britain and I saw the year three exhibit that Steve McQueen did there. And it was, it, it blew my mind. And for, the, for, for everyone saying, all right, what the hell is that, right? And who is that? Uh, long story short, you know, what he did is he captured the year three class, which how old are year three here? It's like... Year three is like eight. Eight, eight, yeah. eight, eight yeah. yeah. Seven or eight, yeah. Seven, eight. So he captured the class, of a photo of the class for every class throughout all of London. It yeah. was something like 76,000 plus students. Yeah, I think I've seen that. I think I've seen that on some train stations. And Oh my gosh. It, it was so incredible that even my six-year-old mm. was mesmerized. And the reason why, quite frankly, is because you say, oh my God, London is black. <laughs> right, that's, that's that's pretty much. He was like, "Wow, like London is black," yeah. And, and, yeah. and so, but you realize it's black and brown. Yeah. Then when I dug into the numbers, inspired by the exhibit, I see that by 2050, not too long from now, we'll all yeah. be alive. Yeah. Right, 2050. Yeah. You know, keep drinking the more water. Um, but by 2050, London or the UK is going to be the same as the US with regard to. Um, ethnic diversity, mm -hmm. okay? So ethnic diversity, the UK and the US will be the two most ethnic diverse nations in the world. And then you know what happens after 2050? The UK takes over mm. as the most ethnic diverse nation in the world. By 2070, this country is going to be predominantly black and brown, and there's going to be 100 million people in this country. Right. So this is incredibly different from today, yeah. where what it's 60 million 64, people, so, yeah. 64 yeah. million. Yeah. And what's the black percentage here? And we make up 13 percent of that number yeah. in the UK. OK, so 13 yeah. percent yeah. to the majority. Yeah. Right. In not that long of a distance. As an entrepreneur, what should we be now thinking about? Uh, with regard to opportunities relative to what's happening with the demographic shift here. Yeah, it's it's really it's really interesting. And actually, it's great that you've kind of raised this as a question because in many ways, that's one of the reasons why Cornerstone was born. But what, what it does, it, it forces traditional sources of capital to look beyond their kind of natural biases. You know, the natural bias being, you know, I want to back a, a white, middle-aged... A man who's been there, done it, worn a T-shirt, grown a business successfully, and is now going again because I view that as a safe, a safe bet. Right. I view that as a sensible profile of business that I want to get behind. Um, and now, what it's what it's encouraging those people to do, in light of sort of what you've described, is actually I need to understand this this market that's emerging. You know, this ethnic minority market that's emerging. You know, I need to understand hair and beauty and how it relates to the black community. I need to understand how um, entrepreneurship and innovation is making itself visible within these communities. But how can I understand that if I don't spend the time unlocking that deal flow? How do I understand it if I don't have an investment team that, ref that fairly reflects yeah. the community that I'm trying to, to support with capital? Right. Um, so that's the opportunity. And I think, you know, to be fair, I think the, the VC community is responding to that. You know, for example, Atomico, you know, they're running a number of different diversity initiatives to try and engage with that that deal flow, engage with businesses that they recognize historically have been overlooked for whatever reason. Right, right. Because they can see where where the market's moving. But but with a lot of these initiatives yeah. here, I f and, and I don't know if this is that uh, with that, that particular company or that particular fund, but I feel like a lot of the initiatives are all-inclusive kind of minority initiatives, which are great. But what I understand about Cornerstone is, Cornerstone is, you know, we're going after black. Is that the case? Because because I, I think there's a, you know, there's a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a difference. What I'm saying is like we're going to go after minority yeah. or going after black. Yeah. I mean, come on, we're yeah. different, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, we've, and we've been quite, um, I guess, candid or, or deliberate with that for, that for that very reason, because... 
as you said, a number of the initiatives that are out there are focused on, I guess, underrepresented more broadly or, or diversity, um, which which are, which is which is great. But when you look at the numbers um, and the data, um, UK businesses with black founders represent less than one percent. Less than one percent of of capital. Um, to, to invest, cap in, to okay. invest okay. Okay. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Capital that's deployed, we we receive less than one percent of the market, um, generally speaking. So then, if we're looking at the problem we're trying to solve, we are trying to address, I guess, the B in BAME. So so BAME, Black and ethnic minority. We're trying to address the fact that the B or, or UK businesses with Black founders receive less money than other demographics. So in order to restore the equilibrium, I guess, and, and, and provide more capital to these types of businesses, we have to focus on UK businesses with black founders. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And just because we're focusing on black founders doesn't mean that we're excluding mm. or downplaying that there are challenges elsewhere. You know, there are right. challenges, for example, in, in backing female founders. You know, female founders get 1%. But black founders get less than 1%. Right. You know, that's where the need is, or at least that's how we view the need. And, you know, I think in this ecosystem, everyone's playing to their strengths. And I think, you know, I really admire the work that other, other organizations are doing to try and at least draw attention to the issue. Yes. Where we think we can play and we can, we can be a part of the solution is, is focusing on, on black founders. On black, okay. And w which, which I love it. I love black people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is good. So now, what are the solutions? Like how, how are we, because, you know, if it's less than 1%, I mean, there's a million different things that you could do. Yeah. So what specifically are you focused on doing? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a really good question. So, and we've, we've had a lot of debates about this. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Exactly. The yeah. gloves are coming Around. out. A lot of debates yeah. about this. So, so, so the, I guess the first thing is, you know, if you look at the market, you know, a, a traditional VC would say, well, I want to back the most scalable business that's available um, I want a business that's going to go global quickly. That would suggest that I've got to go towards a technology business. Yes. That's, that's typically what they would say. And actually, they would also say that because they want to back a technology business and they want to scale it from startup all the way through to a uni unicorn, I'm happy to go in super early, um, you know, pre-seed, pre you know, when the business has got two founders where I can get a decent, decent minority stake and then kind of follow it on its journey. Yes. The challenge in the black community is very, very different. Actually, what's happening in the black community is we're good at starting businesses, but what we're really bad at, or at least for what we found from our from our sort of um, yeah. sort of homework, is that we're not good at scaling them. Mm. You know, you mm. so so a great example is you know there's a um, you know there's Caribbean restaurant that's just just down the road from from sort of where I live. I'm sure I've been to it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to everyone you know? in London. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And, you know, they've got great food. And, you know, you're thinking, this is fantastic. Like, why can't it be the next Carluccio's? Why can't it be the next Vapiano's? Yes. Why are there not 20, 30, 50, 100 of these things? Because they run out of patties at 7 o'clock every night. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they, and why, yeah. why is every... This is, <laughs> this is a serious beef I have. Every Jamaican <laughs> restaurant... Because you say Caribbean. But I'm just saying, I'm assuming... Every Jamaican restaurant runs out of patties <laughs> and oxtail. It's always the lamb patty. Yeah. It's always the lamb patty. Why? Yes. Come on now. <laughs> you guys need to fix this. If you can fix that, everything. Else. It, it, but, but, but no, no. But, but what you're saying is these are facts. Yeah. Why can't it? Why can't? And there's right. no reason because the demand is there. Yeah. You know, I want to go to a, to a brand of Jamaican restaurants that are in 20, 30, 40, yes, man. you know, towns. Yes. And we, we want to we wanna be the guys that back that brand and turn it from three sites to 20 sites. So what's, why are we not scaling these businesses? What's, we what think, are our issues? So we think there's a lack of capital yeah. in this okay. space because what I think we found is that, you know, our competitors are focusing either at the incubation or early stage, i.e. let's bring three or four people together and let's birth an idea or they're focusing at the sort of later stage okay. where there's a kind of a clear path to an IPO or to an exit. Gotcha. Well, actually, there's a gap in the middle. There's an equity gap in the middle for an entrepreneur who's got a product. It's proven. It's monetized. It's generating revenue. But they need, they need experience. They need capital. They need expertise to, to take that model and to replicate it. Interesting. So, so Cornerstone is not just providing capital, but expertise as well. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. Um, Exactly that. So, so we're not only um, providing capital, we're also trying to provide expertise. And if we look at our value proposition, um, the three, three most important things that we're trying to help um, 
you know businesses um, grow with is um, enabling them to have the correct methodologies to progress their KPIs. So yes. forecasting, um, cash forecast, and, and then what have you. So you know making sure that the KPIs are right. Yeah. Um, the second key thing- Key performance exactly, indicators. Key performance yes, indicators. Yes, breaking it down. <laughs> Those acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, the second is just around the strategic- and just, just on that, the reason yeah. why is because you can't grow and you can't measure your success unless you, you, track, you track your performance. Yes, yes. So that's the start. The starting point it has to be, you know, you can't figure out where you're going to go unless you know where you've been. Yes, you know? yes. So you've got to get that piece right. Yes. So sorry. Yeah, so exactly. And and the second thing is all around their strategy and and helping businesses to really optimize their business models, uh, making sure that they have the right processes. Mm -hmm. These processes are efficient, and and all of these things are fundamental to to scaling a business. So that's the second thing. So the first we said, um, what's the first one we said? The data. Yep. Yeah, it was all about the KPIs and the data. The second is all about the, the strategy. And the third is about um, talent expertise. So, so the recruitment, and making yes. sure that they've got the right team, um, you know, the right talent in place, hiring a, hiring a team that's going to enable them to, to, to make their vision a reality. And, and those are the three things in regards to, I guess, the value that we're trying to create. Because it's all about um, realizing value and realizing potential yes. and, and there's lots of it there's lots of unicorns there and, and, and i guess for us we're just trying to support it and, and locate those and, and help them along their their journey and which is why we we launched our first um scale-up program from this year okay yeah please yeah, yeah. To talk about yeah. that yeah yeah so, so 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 in october we launched our first um inaugural um scale-up program so so to really to address the, the points that we, um i mentioned and you know we we had twenty businesses who are part of the cohort, and um, we were in a in a in a room in level thirty nine in Canary Wharf. Um, we had a number of speakers throughout the throughout the eight uh, sessions, which focused on raising capital, um, legal expertise, um, you know, making sure your accounts and your taxes in place, um, optimizing your business models, um, you know, all of the the main aspects you would require to scale your business. Okay. And that was the underlying theme. How do you scale your business? How do you make your business from the one man band or the one person band who's got your one Caribbean shop to a chain of 20 or 30? And, and, and we had a number of organizations who have done that before to try and encourage and teach the cohort to do this. And, and that's what we've just sort of completed. And that was your first one? Yeah. All right. So, so that's going to be ongoing. Yeah. So entrepreneurs listening that want to scale their, their businesses Correct. here in the UK, they can now contact you yeah. to participate in that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Just Super. reach us out on our website, www.cornerstonepartners.co.uk. Okay. Yeah. Done. Done. So there's the scale up. There's obviously the capital that you're investing. Absolutely. Um, how do we take advantage of, of, of the capital? How do we, how do we get money from <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I need so, some money. How do I get it? Yeah. So, so, one, so one of the things we didn't we didn't talk about is that so, so Cornerstone Partners we're we're an angel networks and what's unusual about what we're trying to do is that we we comprise twenty partners um, you know four women um, sixteen guys and we've decided to to pull together our capital. Okay. This is your personal money. This is yeah. our you money. wrote checks. Yeah. Yeah. This is our money because we okay. we believe that. You know, fundamentally, if we if we're so passionate about solving this problem, we've got to put our money where our mouth is. Wow! All right. So we've pulled together our capital. We've currently got just shy of seven hundred fifty thousand pounds. We're wow. going to have a million quid by early twenty twenty. Okay. And what we're doing is we're providing um, checks of between twenty five thousand and a hundred thousand pounds into businesses with black founders in there the UK. There you go. Okay. And that's what we do. Now, and you know, and I always say to an entrepreneur that comes comes to us and, and sort of finds out what we're doing, it's like, why why do you guys set this up? What what was the what was the rationale behind it? And I always say that, you know, imagine us as being your rich uncle. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be, you know, that person in your family that believes in your idea but doesn't have the capital to support you. Right. We're trying to give that opportunity. To, to businesses that have great ideas, that are proven, um, where the, the, the product market fit is right, where they're generating revenue, but they just need a bit more capital to grow. They need capital and expertise. So how, how, how as an entrepreneur, how do, how do we pitch you? 
Yeah, so we so we meet up once a month. Okay. Um, the, the, all the twenty partners meet up in a in a room in Holborn, <laughs> um, in London. <laughs> yeah. Kindly lended to us by um, one of our partners, a guy called Royden Greaves. And essentially, you you apply on our website. Okay. Um, so you just just go onto our website www.cornerstonepartners.co.uk. You submit a few details about yourself. You provide us with a short deck, and that will that will then be handed over to our investment team. And then you you physically come and meet us. All right. Is it, so is this the pitch or what? It, that's the pitch. You come okay. and pitch. So it's like you know. You know, it's not it's not a shark tank. It's not a dragon's <laughs> den. I think it's a little bit. I think it's a little bit more collaborative than that. But you know, we, we, you know, we buy into people first and foremost, as well as to a business model and a business idea. So we we want to see you. Okay. You know, we want to see you, want to engage with you, and actually, it's a great opportunity for the entrepreneurs to see us and meet us. True. Yeah. So they come in, they pitch for twenty minutes. We ask we ask some questions. You know, we might we might sort of make a few jokes. They might make a few jokes. <laughs> we make sure they're well looked after, and then and then um you know we 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 respond hopefully within a couple of weeks about whether we want to take it forward or not. That quick, and exactly. That's what well, it is. Exactly. Wow. Well. And and the key thing is that application um, process. So, you know, if if your offering is compelling enough and and you you've clearly you know have some traction and there's some promise there you know the investment team will pick it up and give you the opportunity to then um pitch so i guess there's two steps to that process so it's the first step whereby you send your application in and you, you know you, you talk about your business in the pitch deck you know what the problem is what is the solution you know how, how are you going to progress what's your forecast like what have you achieved so far and then once the investment team reviews that information and says okay you know this is something that we perhaps would like to know more about we would then invite you into pitch uh -huh. um, and then you'd meet the team and then we you know we go from there i love it so what's the requirement in order to uh in in, in order to get into the room with you all what's really the requirement so i have to be black <laughs> all right so check yeah. see yeah. All right. so you need to so so i think so in terms of our focus our area of focus is um it doesn't matter what sector you're in, and actually, I think that's a really important point. So, okay. we're not obsessed with technology. You know, if you if you if you want to run a, a coffee shop, you know, shout out to Jess and the Bean Store who, <laughs> who just won our <laughs> won our scale up program. Oh, nice. You know, if you want to go into media, if you want to do technology, if you want to do business services, recruitment, consulting, it doesn't matter. What is important is you have a business that you think you can scale. You just need support and you need help. Okay. That's the first thing. Secondly, that you, there's a black founder or at least one one member of the senior team is, is black because okay. our view is that that's where the problem lies and that's what we want to focus on. Okay, question on this. Yes. All right. What constitutes being black? That's a great question. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, That's I a great like, question. Yeah. Do you like... Is it about how you eat your chicken? Like, what, <laughs> what, what, what's, what constitutes being black? Because in the U.S., you know, we had, I don't know, you know about a Plessy versus Ferguson? No. It was a, it was a court case right? many moons ago. Yeah. And basically, it stated that one-eighth of, quote-unquote, black African blood constituted someone being black, right? You were black. But once I got here to London... Man, people are like, no, no, they're, they're mixed race. You know, it's like, <laughs> they're, about, they're mixed race. Oh, okay, all right. They're, they look black to me, yeah. but so what is what is black? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know what? You're asking that key, that killer question because <laughs> yeah. in many ways, we're all black, right? <laughs> right, we're all right. Black. We all come all from the African, motherland of Africa. Yeah. Yeah. We are all, all black. <laughs> we're all black, but, you know, for us, I think if, if you are of black descent, so we're not we're not saying you've got to you you've got to come from Africa. We're saying you know if you're Caribbean, if you're African, if you're mixed race, if you if you identify as being black, I think we, we we're happy to have a conversation with you. What's okay. really important is that we're not just engaging with businesses that serve black communities. We, we ultimately we don't care what community you serve. You know, is the does the business work? What matters okay. is that you, as a founder who is of black descent, we would argue. The VC community, as it currently set up, isn't helping you, isn't right. serving you, okay, and I'm we're trying to we're trying to be a, an alternative source of funding for you. I'm with you. So, black descent, any sector, yeah. Uh, yeah. What level of business should and, I and be? And just at? on that last one, and at least one person from black descent on that senior management board. Oh, on the senior. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Which that opens it up. Yeah. 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 Which which is nice. Uh, so then, what 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 stage of business should I be at? How much revenue should I be at? Yeah, so it should be. Um, so we're not looking, f I guess, businesses that are idea stage um, initially, and, and that's partly because of, I guess, risk, and and the type of business that we're you know we're trying to um, support. It's a business who is on that trajectory to scale up their their businesses and 
will have a revenue of at least fifty thousand pounds. Okay, annually. Annually. Okay. And and the reason why um and, and it doesn't have to be exactly fifty thousand pounds, but what the idea is it's a business which is past idea stage. You know, they've they've managed to get some traction, you know, they've got some sales and, and perhaps they're onto a good thing, but they just need that support and that guidance and that capital fundamentally to get them to, to the progress next. and to yeah. get to the next level. Do they need to be profitable? No. No. Okay. I mean, just give you a flavor of, you know, we've already done a couple of investments and, you know, they range from, I think the smallest business we've, d we've done is is turning over a couple of thousand pounds. The largest business is turning over north of a million. Okay. So it's a real mix. I think the, the sweet spot for us is probably some a business that's doing between 100K and half a million, okay. something like that. Okay. That, but, but no, profitable is, is not, profitability is not key to us. What, what's key is traction. All right, gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then I'm just curious about this because I know a lot of people will, 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 will be interested is once they're in the room, how do they get the money? I mean, <laughs> I mean, what do they need to say? What are the magic words? I mean, is it a special wink that they do in the room? What do they need yeah, to goodies, do? Goodies. Yeah, but, how, but, how, but really, how, because, you know, you talked about salesmanship is not really yeah. Yeah. prided here, you know? Yeah. So I would imagine a lot of winning in the room is yeah. salesmanship, though. Yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely sales, salesmanship. But I would say the numbers, the KPIs, and that traction, so if you can, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you can really articulate, you know, what what your business has achieved and where you see the business going in the next few years, and back that with traction that you know you're you're on your way um, um, to realizing that particular goal, you know, that would definitely turn heads. Yes. So I would say. I wouldn't walk in the room if you haven't got your numbers down to a T. Okay. You know, if you and don't understand all of your KPIs, you know, where you're going. So, because we're going to ask those questions. And, right. And you need to be all over that. And what I think I'm hearing, which I love, is that I also don't have to present that my growth trajectory is 10,000% over the next three years. It's like, you know, that's not, you don't need that, right? No. You just need growth. Yeah, correct. Okay, this and, is and, good. And just to be realistic, I mean, it could be that that's the trajectory, but if it isn't, you know, you don't need to come in with and wow us with numbers that are not, I guess, accurate or or a bit unbelievable. You need to come in with, you know, realistic goals, a meaningful business where where it's clear that you know, if with a bit more support and capital, you know, you you, you could be onto something. You know, you could turn your business from a business that's turning over seventy thousand pounds per annum to perhaps three hundred, four hundred k you know, in, in, in the next year and then maybe more in the next few years. Okay. And, and that's the key thing, what we're looking for. Um, you know, good KPIs, good numbers, a good strategy yes. and a good team. Yes. I think KPI is your favorite word. You are an accountant at heart. You, yeah. like, it's yeah. all about the data. Yeah. It's all, Absolutely. but no, no, but I'm, I'm with it. Like, like you need, you need to know the numbers, yeah. Yeah. you know? So last question for you. All right. Let's say that you are, my man Josiah over here, yeah, and you are independently wealthy. He's worth millions upon millions of dollars, right? Or pounds, right? And he's listening to all of this, and he says, "You know what? I want in on Con Cornerstone Partners, mm -hmm. but I want to become an investor." Have you opened up the door to the Josiahs of the world? It's a great question. I think right now we've decided not to. Oh, so, so what, Josiah! What? They don't want your money. <laughs> they don't want your money. So, <laughs> And I think I think it's it's uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that we find it quite powerful when an entrepreneur comes in and pitches to us, and they realise that the people they're looking at are the people that are actually going to give them the money. Yeah, true. So I think true. that's that's quite powerful versus you know opening up to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of angels and not having that kind of direct connection with them. I think that's the first thing. But I think secondly, the more, more important thing is actually we love what we're doing and we're going to continue doing it, but we'd love to help more businesses. And I think for us, we believe the best way to do that is by raising a fund. Ah, uh, okay. And so what we would like to do is, and we're actually you know, actively fundraising at the moment, we're looking to raise a, a 50 million um, pound fund. Okay. Um, with the objective of being able to support businesses in a more meaningful way beyond that initial check size of 100K. So moving up the chain slightly, still, still focusing on the mission of backing post-revenue, businesses from any sector with black founders, but actually having a dedicated pot of money um, to support those businesses. Wow. So if you've got any any wealthy, high net worth <laughs> individuals out there that love that story and that want to be part of that journey with us, then please reach out to us. You know, 
you know, website www.cornerstonepartners.co.uk or rodney at cornerstonepartners.co.uk or wilfred at cornerstonepartners.co.uk. We'd love to have a chat with you guys. What's, um, what's, what's, what's the minimum? Minimum investment for the fund? What do we, what do we, what do we need? Minimum. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, for for institution in, for institutions, you, we are, I guess, between two and five. Okay, but we are we are open um, to conversations. They're open. Yeah. See, that's what I like. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I like about black business. <laughs> We're always open. Like, well, yeah, you come talk to me. Come talk to me. But um, but I tell you what, I greatly applaud you all. I mean, all the partners uh, for what you all are doing. One of my first stops here when I got to London was actually to a Cornerstone meeting. And I, I'm, I'm highly impressed with what you all do, but I'm more impressed with the vision. Mm. And I'm appreciative, you know, speaking on behalf of all the entrepreneurs, but no, speaking on behalf of, <laughs> you know, of, of black entrepreneurs, we're very appreciative. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's great. Well. Yeah, it's a privilege. It. There you go. That's it. Yeah. Mm.